listening to our podcast, the Slowpoke Travel Podcast. We hope you enjoy our podcast. The podcast starts right now. Slowpoke Travel Podcast with Buck and Camera Girl. Ta-da! Just uh, threw the camera and turned it on to catch me looking at how it's on my phone. I don't know if that's going to focus in on there, but this is the app on my phone. And I've got... Uh, different filters set up so that when certain kinds of house hits come up, my phone makes a noise to let me know. And then I check my phone and see if I'm interested in the house hit. And I'm always looking. My phone's always dinging for something for me to see. And I got to check it out because I have, you know, I mean, they're all, you know, I, I'm an addictive personality, you know. Whether it's donuts or blackjack or old westerns, you know, I got to uh, I got to dive right in. And house sitting is just another, or looking at house sits on my phone, is just another addiction that I have. But I will put it down now that I've started talking because I wanted to talk about house sitting today uh, because it's one of my favorite subjects. I talk a lot about house sitting. Well, this is a travel channel, and uh, house sitting is a big part of our life, uh, camera girl and I, uh, since we left Seattle in 2017. At the end of 2017, we joined Trusted House Sitters, and we've been house sitting a fairly large portion of our time since then. In fact, this year, I think we're when we conclude this house sit here, we will have house sat for six months this year, and maybe we'll line something up. Uh, for the rest of December, and that'll make it really seven months this year. But we'll see, because we don't have anything lined up yet, which is why I'm looking. But, you know, with house sitting, you have to figure out what you want in a house sit, and then try to match your desires to what's available. And sometimes we have a very uh, broad uh swath of potential house sets and you know going to this into this winter we have a very narrow spectrum of potential house sets because i don't want to go anywhere that's cold so that's going to make it kind of tough because there are a lot of house sets in north america a lot of it in the north where it's going to be cold a lot in canada a lot in europe so, a lot of cold weather places. Um, you know, I'm looking in Mexico and South America, but there aren't as many uh, there. I mean, there's a lot in Australia, but that sounds like uh, more of a plane ride and more of an expense that I'm interested in. So, that's probably not going to happen. So, because I'm looking for a warm place for the winter, I'm having a hard time lining up a house set. But that's what's on my mind. So I thought I would um, maybe tell a, a story about house sitting today, one of our house sitting experiences, because we've had a few house sitting experiences. And I'm always talking house sitting up. I'm always saying how wonderful house sitting is. You know, I make a great ambassador for house sitting because I love it. And I highly recommend it. I don't know if it's for everybody, but it's certainly, you know, if you, if you, uh, or a student or a retired person or you're able to uh, work on your computer wherever you're at um, you know if you have a lot of flexibility then house sitting I think is really ideal and something you should definitely investigate and look into and it benefits me the more people that are interested in house sitting benefits me because you know there will be more people looking for house sits but I think if you have a dog or a cat you know, and you want to travel, house sitting, you know, getting a house sitter in to uh, watch your home and pet while you're gone is, I mean, that's, seems like a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer for us, and it's a no-brainer for the house people we're house sitting for. Uh, we have some friends um, that we turned them on to house sitting. They are dog owners, and so now they are able to travel more and get somebody into their house to watch their dog while they're gone. And it frees them up. They used to pay people to do it. Uh, but with trusted house sitters or whatever house sitting site 
uh, that a uh, person chooses to use. You can get somebody in, you know, who will do it for free, just like Camera Girl and I do it for free. Uh, it's just an exchange of services. So, you know, you, you get to travel, and then somebody comes and watches your home and probably your pet, because it's almost always pet sitting. Um, I, I've gone over all that before. <laughs> I know my house sitting videos get a little repetitive, but there'll be links down below. If you want to check out house sitting, uh, Camera Girl has written up some pretty good uh, blogs with a lot of good information about different places uh, where you can house sit. I'll link below to our our blog post that'll have a number of links where you can go check out different house sitting sites. Like I always say, we use trusted house sitters. Not making any money on that. It's just the one I use because they have a, an app that functions very well and just seems like there's a lot of things to look at on that site. And so I really enjoyed it. And I think we've completed, uh, maybe we're working on our 17th sit now after you know four or five years. 2020 was kind of a bust. But all the rest of the years we did a lot of house sits. In fact, since we sort of semi started traveling again since COVID, I think we have, well, last year we did house sits in uh, North Carolina, um, Rhode Island, New Orleans, and Florida. And this year, um, our New Orleans house sit bled over into uh, this year. And then we've just been doing Florida so far this year. Multiple house sits in Florida. Uh, but looking for something new and exciting in the future. But last year, when we were house sitting, we were uh, one time in the mountains in, uh, in the Carolinas near... Um, the Smoky Mountain National Park, and we were house sitting a dog and uh, uh, chickens, and it was a cabin in the woods, you know, down a dirt road, surrounded by mountains and forest, and it was just a wonderful area. It had a had a nice yard for the dog to go out and play in, and but then there were nice trails that we could also take the dog hiking on. And, you know, we'd be taking the dog out, you know, and we'd have him on the leash. And sometimes we'd let him off on the leash and let him run around in the woods, which was uh, very exciting and fun for the dog. Although sometimes he would run off and chase turkeys. And I don't know, I always get a little bit apprehensive uh, when I take an animal that I'm house sitting out into the wild and let them, you know, or a park or anywhere and let them off the leash, which I only do if you know, that's what the owner does. If the owner wants us to do that, you know, to keep the, the animal in the routine, we will. Although, you know, it's a little nerve wracking when that happens. It's like outdoor cats. I love house sits with indoor cats because I like the cat to be under my total, complete control. Uh, and then when the cat goes outside, who knows what's gonna happen with the cat. So it's very, um, I don't know, it's, it's not nerve-wracking, really, because I've gotten used to it. So if it's an outdoor cat, an indoor-outdoor cat, and the cat goes outside, you know, I'm, I'm more zen about it than I used to be. But still, when the animal's off-leash or out of my control, it's, it does cause some level of apprehension. But in this house sit in the Carolinas, a couple of times we were out uh, with the dog and we encountered bears, you know, like black bears. And I think both times, I think it was the same uh, mama bear with two cubs. So that would freak the dog out and the dog would start barking and running towards the bear. And then we'd have to start hollering at the dog and then get a hold of the dog. Of course, the bears uh, took off uh, pretty quickly. You know, we just saw them for a moment. You know, the bears were shocked. We were shocked. The dog was very excited. <laughs> and then there would be uh, a moment of intense physicality and then the bears would be gone and the dog would be barking and, uh, you know, we'd be standing there with our hearts thumping and, you know, going, oh my God, that was so close, you know. Close to what? I don't know. Close to uh, the dog getting into a bear altercation. I don't know. 
but I like to see bears uh, from afar uh, more than I like to see bears close up while I'm walking a dog. But that was one animal encounter that we had on this house sit that we did in the cabin in the woods. Another animal encounter that we had during this house sit and what made this house sit a little bit exciting was there was something under the house. We could hear it at night. You know, we'd been house sitting there uh, for a few weeks and it was a uh, cabin and it had a basement area or it had an area under the house. Uh, where there was a little bit of a crawl space for storage. Uh, but there was a little door under the house and you could go into this little room. And then there was a vast expanse under the house that was kind of dark and shady and haunted, sort of like in a uh, Bloomhouse horror movie, sort of like one of those. You get under there with a flashlight and you're looking around and, you know, it's best not to be under there. But something was under there. And it was driving the dog crazy. So the dog would be barking. Run, you know, the dog would get up in the middle of the night and he'd start barking and running all over the house and we'd be laying in bed and listening. And we could hear, you know, besides the dog running around and barking, we could hear an animal under the house moving around and exploring. And the animal, of course, was going a little bit crazy too because there's this dog up above him running around barking. So, you know, that's not... That's probably not good for the dog. You know, the dog would like to get a nice uh, evening sleep, and we'd get in, like to get in a good night's sleep too, but it's kind of hard to sleep because we've got this very nocturnal animal. We're on different schedules, you know. We and the dog, you know, are trying to catch some Z's, and then, uh, you know, wild animal kingdom critter down below, he's just getting up and starting his day. So that makes for a rough night. So we had to do something about it, you know, because, you know, we're house sitters. We got to take care of the house. You know, we got to take care of the dog. You know, we don't want the homeowner to return to return and find that the dog has, you know, severe uh, mental issues and sleep deprivation and, you know, all kind of anxiety. And you have to put the dog on Xanax because he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs because of wild animal kingdom under the house. So we have to address this. So there is a live animal trap on the property, which is like an aluminum thingamabob. It looks like a wire suitcase and it has some flappy flaps on the end. And it's for catching animals without killing them. You know, if there hadn't have been one of those, I don't know what I'd have done. I guess I'd have dug a hole and put some bungee sticks, sticks or did one of those. What's that thing in Rambo? Was it a Rambo movie where the thing swings out and it's got bungee and... I don't know. But I don't want to do that to some poor animal, whatever it is. You know, I don't want to set some nefarious killer mousetrap type thing. But fortunately, we have this live animal trap. So I set that up, you know, down below in this little, you know, open the door, little area under the house. And, you know, in this area, there are some bird, there are some bags of bird seed. There are some things stored under the house that have made this animal interested. And that's why he's taking up residence in there, you know. And so he's, he's been clawing into these bags. And, you know, it's like, it's like heaven for him down here under the house. So he's not going anywhere. So I have to trap him and get rid of him. So we set up this this trap under the house, you know, when you open the doors, the little flap and you wear, you know, you kind of rig it with a hair trigger and you put, you know, a little, uh, like a half an apple, you know, in a little baggy thing and secure it inside the cage so that whatever it is will go in there and trip the thing and then be stuck in the cage with an apple twiddling his thumbs waiting for me. So the first night I've got the trap in there, wake up at like, two o'clock in the morning or whatever, the dog starts to go crazy. You know, we can hear some excitement down below. That sounds, it's not a good sound. But anyway, I go downstairs with my little flashlight and I open the thing and there's nothing to be seen. You know, the trap 
is not trapped, but my Apple thing is gone. So I haven't set the trap up very well. You know, and the dog, you know, he's still very excited. I have failed. So that was the first night. Second night, same thing. I'm just, you know, but the, the, the trap trapped on the second night, but I still didn't have anything. So, but I, I don't have anything to do, but keep on keeping on. You know, I'm not, what am I? I'm not the alligator hunter. I'm not Marlon Perkins. Marlon Perkins didn't do anything though. Marlon Perkins just narrated and Jim, remember Jim? Jim is wrestling with the zebra. Probably didn't wrestle a zebra. I can't remember what Jim did. Did Jim do alligators? I doubt it. I think the alligator hunter was the first uh, guy jumping on alligators. I think there's a few fellows jumping on alligators nowadays, but I didn't think this was an alligator. But I still wasn't sure what it was. Of course, I thought, well, it's probably a possum. It's probably a raccoon. It's maybe a coyote. I don't know. But I set the trap for a third night. I've got, I think I had an apple with some peanut butter on it. And I had it, I don't know how I had it in the thing. But anyway, I had some kind of bait in the trap and I had the trap set. And on the third night, caught a raccoon. The dog's going crazy. I go downstairs, open up the door, and there's a raccoon going crazy in the cage. And, you know, there's a little light, you know, in the thing, and I turn it on, and I got my flashlight. It's a dull light, and I'm looking around. I can't hardly see, but it's not a pretty picture because, of course, the raccoon's initial defense mechanism is diarrhea. So, diarrhea. Two things you don't want. You don't want raccoons and you don't want diarrhea. And I got both of them in spades. Anyway, cut off the light, go upstairs. You know, everything calms down. The raccoon's downstairs banging around for a little bit. Eventually he calms down. Everybody calms down. You know, everybody, we're on a wait and see pattern, but I'm not doing anything at night. I'm definitely not, you know, going under the house and dealing with a caged raccoon covered in diarrhea in the middle of the night. So first thing in the morning, as soon as it gets sort of light, I go downstairs and I try to get the trap out, but I got to be very careful because raccoons have human hands and they can reach out. And this, this raccoon is, you know, when I approach the cage, he's, he's trying to get out of the cage to... You know, he's, re he, you know, we're not friends. He knows that right off the bat. So he's trying to grab me with these little, I mean, they look like, you know, like he could deal cards. They are human hands. Raccoons have very dirty human hands with claws. They're like um, on the new house, what is it, House of the Dragon? You know, with all the dragons? Raccoons are very much like those dragons. They're like very small dragons, except this particular uh, raccoon was much more fierce. He was about the size of a house cat, but a big house cat, but much more fierce with dragon talon bubonic plague hands that would reach out through the cage. Super duper scary. So I had, to, I had to rig up this rig where I could pick up the cage without actually being within reach of the raccoon. And now I've got this raccoon, but what am I going to do with the raccoon? Because I just can't take him outside and let him go because he's just going to turn around and come back into Nirvana heaven with the bird seed under the house. So I can't, I can't release him into the wilds of wherever we're at. That's not going to do it. So I have to put him into our car and drive him somewhere. Luckily, you know, we're near uh, the Smoky Mountain National Park. You know, there's lots of national forest land. So there, you know, I have some choices of places to take him. So I drive probably for 10 or 15 miles, get to a national forest area and get the raccoon out of the thingamabobby jig without, without him grabbing me. Because I'm, you know, he's in charge really. I've got him in the cage, but he is dictating everything. I'm sort of exhausted uh, just 
just thinking about it because it was so tense. Because I was almost afraid, you know, the, uh, to open this cage because I didn't know what this raccoon was going to do when I opened this cage. I wanted the raccoon to thrive. I wanted the raccoon to live. I wanted to release him into the wilds and, and for him to go off and have a Disney movie existence. I wanted the best for this raccoon. But there was a part of me that was afraid that when I opened this trap, this raccoon's going to come out and just kick my ass. Because he looked, he had the attitude like he could. And he probably could have. That raccoon pound for pound, I mean, I was nothing compared to this raccoon. So I'm standing back. I got a rope tied up to the thing of Bobby Jig. I'm probably like 10 feet off. I've got this thing rigged up to where I can pull the thing, open the door, because it's kind of tricky. There was kind of a little tricky trick tricky deal to get the thing open and I should have figured that out before I got the raccoon in but you know I don't trap a lot of raccoons but I finally figured it out and had a thing rigged so where I could pull the rope and the thing would open up and I'd be far enough away to where if the raccoon ran toward me you know maybe I could jump on top of the car or something and survive but I opened the cage door and the raccoon he just kind of sat there you know, he kind of, he was looking at me, the door opened, and he's looking at the door, and he's just looking at me, and he just sat there for the longest time, like he didn't believe it, and eventually, you know, he just kind of, he got a little bit curious, and he sort of walked up to the front of the door, and he kind of looked out, and then he just kind of got cocky, and then he just kind of shuffled out like the, like it was all his idea that we were there in the first place and then he walked off into the woods just you know as calm as you please <laughs> which was a great relief to me but I do imagine that he has gone off on his uh, Disney adventure and I spent the rest of the day cleaning up diarrhea in various areas and inside the cage and de-diarrheaing um, the whole situation, which obviously was very traumatic for the raccoon. And, I don't know, was it traumatic for me? A little bit. But that could happen when you're house-sitting. When you're house-sitting, if you're house-sitting in a rural area, you might have to, uh, you might have to catch a live animal. And if it's in Australia, Maybe it'll be a crocodile or alligator. Or it could be a raccoon or a possum or a boa constrictor if you're in Florida. Anything, but house sitting is, is very exciting. I mean, we've had to deal with tsunamis and hurricanes and uh, wild animals. But um, I recommend it very highly. So if anybody has watched our videos and you have actually been inspired to go house sitting or give house sitting a try, uh, I don't know if anybody has ever watched our videos and then and about house sitting and then explored or looked into house sitting. But if you do look into it, you know, let us know what you think. Or if you have, uh, you know, I'm I'm always saying very positive things about house sitting. Um, I don't have a lot of negative things to say about it. I don't think there's much negative to it as long as you are flexible and you sort of vet the house sit as best you can. You just got to make sure that the house sit, what you have to do, matches with what you want to do. You know, because you don't want to be in a house sitting scenario where you feel like, you know, because it's an exchange of services. So you got to make sure that the people you're house sitting for are very happy and you got to make sure that you're very happy because you want it to be a win-win so that's the um i think that's the most important part of house sitting um, kind of figure out exactly what you want you want to make sure that your house sitting uh pets that you want to be around you want to make sure that you're in a location that you want to be you want to make sure that the responsibilities you know, because some house sits I see, I mean, it looks like a lot of work. Some house sits look like a lot as far as animal care. And if you, if that's your goal, then, um, then that'll work. But man, you know, if you get into a house sit where 
you know, they've got four dogs and they want to walk them four times a day, then that's all you're going to be doing. You're not going to be able to do anything else. So, you know, if it's a rural house sit, like we had the house sit with the dog and the, the cat and the chickens and everything. And so there was a little bit to do during the day. But it was a rural area and it was beautiful and we loved hanging out there and being there and doing all that stuff. If we had that same animal scenario in Seattle and we wanted to get out and explore the city and enjoy the environment outside of the home, that would have been, maybe it would have been more frustrating than enjoyable. So you want to make sure that things match um, um, what the actual house it is is going to match up with what um, your desires are and vice versa. Uh, for the homeowner. Anyway, I'm just rambling now. But uh, that's it. That's how. That's a house sitting story. I hope everybody's doing super duper. I guess uh, next week might be Thanksgiving if I'm putting this up at this time. Who knows? But anyway, I hope everybody has a happy holiday and we'll see you soonly. Also, we got our cooking channel. Uh, links down below to everything in the whole wide world. Uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Alrighty, that is it. Click, subscribe, review, share all over the global internet sphere. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next time on the Slowpoke Travel Podcast.